So let's look empirically to see what happens. Here is the post-war period. The dark line is hourly productivity, so it's going up like this. The solid line is the actual path of hourly real compensation. So it seems to be rising parallel to, actually it's rising more slowly because these are index numbers. Above or below each other means nothing. They are indexed to the 1982 equals 1. But it seems to be rising at least in, along with productivity until about 1983, which is Reagan comes in right here in 1980. So then you get the profit, uh, real compensation slowing down, and you get productivity rising. So the gap between the two is dramatically raised. And there are various ways to estimate what the product actual path of real compensation would have been. I took a very conservative way that said, OK, real compensation would rise more slowly than productivity, but not as slowly as the actual path. So what is happening, the first thing that's happening in the, in the, with the Reagan-Thatcher revolution is a break is applied to real wage growth. So that is now growing more slowly than productivity, which means that gap boosts profitability. To put it in, in Marxist terms, what's happening here is a dramatic rise in the rate of exploitation. One of the things that he says is a countervailing factor, but it doesn't mean it comes out of the air, it comes out of social political balance between capital and labor, with the state acting on one side or the other. And it's clear this side, the state is acting on the side of capital. So that's the first thing. Any questions about this? One could argue that this is a reaction to the crisis, a restoration of profitability by increasing the rate of exploitation. This then leads me to ask, what, would have, what happened to the profit rate, actually? And what would have happened had there not been this counter-revolution? Well, this is the profit rate uh, of, uh, in the economy, uh, corporate sector, I think, in the, in the book. And you can see that it declines. It has cycles. Here's the great Vietnam War boom. So it pumps up the profit rate. But then the profit rate comes back down to its trend. And I have plotted the normal capacity levels in the book, but I'm skipping that here. But you can see that what's happening is the normal profit rate is falling, and then there are fluctuations around it. Uh, and then you hit the stagflation crisis, where profitability is falling, because the unemployment rate keeps getting pumped down. Employment gets pumped up by the state, and profitability declines because the wage share doesn't fall as much in a crisis, or it doesn't fall at all. It keeps rising. So the profit rate falls. And then comes this counter-revolution, where uh, the wage rate is now decelerated, and uh, productivity keeps on rising, accelerated, in fact. So the profit rate ends up stabilizing. That is the real purpose and success of the Reagan revolution. It restored the profitability of capital in the United States. It had it not done that, one can estimate the path that the profit rate would have taken in the absence of the intervention by the state. Any questions? Uh, I simply took the previous estimation of where the wage would have gone. And that would give me where the profit share would have gone. And other things being equal, that gives me where the profit rate would have gone. Now, one can do more sophisticated things, but I'm not interested in the exact number as I am in the general pattern. OK? That's a good paper topic. I'll give you the data, or you can reproduce the data and see, tell the story in a more econometric way or a different way. I don't think I'll change the story, but it may change some of the numbers and pictures. OK? Now, as I said, all along, the accumulation is driven by two things, the profit rate and the interest rate. And so far, we've talked about the fact that Keynesian policy has a self-negating effect on the profit rate. Insofar as it's successful in bringing the unemployment rate down, it tends to raise the wage share relative to whatever its trend is, which tends to reduce the profit rate relative to its trend and undermine the stimulus, because then uh, unemployment comes back up. And then you have a tendency, if you don't understand that, to stimulate more. But the other variable is the interest rate. And I argue in the book that the interest rate, under, in the absence of state determination, the market interest rate is determined by profitability, by the profitability of capital. The, the rate which gives you a normal profit rate will be the long-term center of gravity of the market interest rate. And I show from that 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 impli implies that the interest rate will move along with the price level. And indeed, here is the uh, GDP deflator. And here is the interest rate. And you see the broad, similar movement. There are many other local factors. There are wars here. This is the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, this is the great stagflation. This is the Volcker shock, where Volcker uh, dramatically increases the interest rate using state policy. Uh, 
And then afterwards, state policy begins to take control of the interest rate and lower it, still subject to cycles, until it is almost zero. Never been done before. So what are you doing when you do that? Other things being equal, if the profit rate is moving in a particular way and the interest rate is moving along with it, then the net rate of profit is moving in the same direction, whatever it is, downward, upward. But now, if you're lowering the interest rate, then your profit rate, the net profit rate is rising. Because even if the profit rate is falling, the interest rate is falling so much, the net rate of profit is rising. And this is another way of saying that what this did was restore accumulation. Restored in two ways. It stabilized the fall in the profit rate. So the profit rate went falling, 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 and then Reagan Thatcher, it becomes stable. And then the net rate of interest, which was actually falling, uh, 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 rising rather, is now turned around and is falling sharply, which means the gap between the profit rate and net rate is rising, which accumulation is greatly stimulated. So this was a great era for capital. Short-term interest rate is reduced to near zero, uh, and the profit rate uh, is stabilized. This is another way of looking at the interest rate, where now what we did is we calculated the interest rate uh, in the US trading partners, which pretty much all the major players in the capitalist labor market, uh, financial market. And you can see that the rise in the interest rate parallels sort of inflation in the, in the post-war period. And then it stops paralleling inflation, because inflation continues like this, slows down, whereas the interest rate goes down. So this is the era of the great uh, monetary policy stimulus, which is to lower the interest rate. Having tried first the fiscal stimulus and run into limits, the next step was the monetary stimulus. And it lowers the interest rate, definitely. And yet, nonetheless, we end up in the current crisis. So how can that be? If capital has the power to stimulate the system and maintain profitability at the same time, then how did we get this crisis? Actually, that graph was supposed to be taken out. Forget that. This is the correct graph. It's the same graph. It's just taken longer, uh, over a longer period of time. So this is the correct graph. So now we come to the, the contradictions in uh, the neoliberal boom. The neoliberal boom restored accumulation by uh, reducing wages relative to productivity, so it stabilized the profit rate. It wasn't falling anymore. It was roughly stable. And it reduced the interest rate, so it created a gap between the profit rate and the interest rate, which was very positive and, in fact, restored growth and restored um, un uh, employment, raised employment, so that the unemployment rate fell. So those are those two elements. But the reduction in interest rates also made debt much cheaper. So that stimulated the private creation of new purchasing power from the point of view of borrowers. People could borrow. If the interest rate was cheaper, you could borrow more. And this spurred the rise of business, government, and personal debt across the globe. With low interest rates, you could lend to money anywhere, anywhere in the globe. The costs were very low. And uh, for households whose real wage growth was slowed down, so their real income was slowed down, and even flattened in most cases, borrowing allowed you to keep your expenditures above. So it covered up the effect of the decline in real wages, the decline in household income, because expenditures could now be bigger than they were before because you could borrow the money. And so we can see this is household to debt income ratio, 1975. And you can see this period is the end of the great stagflation. But here comes the Reagan-Thatcher boom. and Household to debt income ratio rises dramatically, virtually effectively doubles. And then comes the global crisis and it begins to fall. Let's just say 2011, not 2911, at the top here. Okay? But how could households keep on piling on debt? The answer is because. If you pile on debt, but the debt costs less, and if you can refinance at least, then the debt to service ratio, the amount of money you pay for the debt, which is your amortization payments and your interest payments, can actually fall. So what was happening is that the uh, household debt service ratio didn't rise just dramatically like that. It rose for a while, then the interest rate fall came down, brought it down, then people borrowed more rapidly, and it brought it back up. So the movements of the debt service ratio were not so big, between 11 and 14%. In effect, people were getting deeper and deeper into debt, but they were paying less for it because interest rates were going down so that they could give them a chance to go further into debt. And of course, when the crisis hit, then you get this dramatic fall because bankruptcies, people are not able to pay off their houses, so they abandon them. They have uh, debts they have to pay off because their incomes are gone, or they don't pay them off, they default on them. So you get a tremendous decline that takes place here. Okay. And these are well documented, established phenomena. But the main point is that these are natural consequences of the escape from the ninth, uh, Great Depression, uh, Great Stagflation of the 70s, was, which was one element, which was to cut wages, 
reduce the growth of wages, to stabilize wages. The other was to reduce the interest rate. And these two interacted here. Now, I want to end with uh, something that I used to do in classes uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, I got a letter recently from a student who was in my undergraduate class who said, I remember you said that the crisis was going to come in 2008. I remember the graphs and all that. And so I've archived that letter because I don't necessarily, I don't have videos. But uh, what I did in those classes beginning, I, my recollection is around 2003, 2004. I think the student was in that, in that range. He was 2007. But I repeated this, of course, in classes. So um, I took the long waves that we saw before and I smoothed them. These waves, which are the price waves in terms of gold. That is, instead of measuring the US price level in dollars, I measure it in ounces of gold. Same thing for British pounds. I take the British pound and I divide it by the price of, of uh, I multiply it by the price of gold per pound. I think that's right. And uh, then you get the gold price of British commodities. So if you do that, this turbulent data is what you get. But if you smooth the data, then, and you take only the last two cycles. So this is the two cycles prior to the present one. And this is the HP filter of the two. And you can see here the Great Depression on the downturn of the first cycle, the Great Stagflation, the downturn of the second cycle. And so since I was around here, uh, 2000 here, I'm thinking, well, when's the next one? So I use some very simple technique. I said, well, OK, the difference between the peak and the onset of the Great Depression was nine years in the first one. In the second one, the difference between the peak and the onset of the Great Stagflation was eight years, since I had timing of it in elsewhere. So given that we were now 2000 is this peak, eight years, eight to nine years from 2000 would have put me at 2008, 2009. And so that was my simple prediction of the next crisis, 2008, 2009. Of course, it came a year earlier. But there's an interesting part of that also. Uh, I bought my house in 1997, and it's gone up a lot. But New York City has been immune to this sets of cycles uh, since that time, because as people move away from other places, they move to New York City, and they move from Manhattan to Brooklyn. So you cannot m make a story of the general price movements for all local things. It's like a stream. You, know, you can see the stream going down, but you'll find spots in the stream where the water is going the opposite direction. Not that I can say I have any great expertise in this. was a very simple exercise, largely for illustration in a class, undergraduate and graduate class for illustration, to show you that the recurrence of crisis implies the recurrence of the next one. That's a key point. Another interesting question. How long do these crises last? Every crisis leads to a recovery so far, which transforms capitalism in some fundamental sense. But it doesn't remove the driving force, which is profitability. It doesn't remove the incentive for capitalists to look at their profit rate and look at the interest rate and to accumulate relevant to costs and all of that. That's built into the genetic structure. But it does change the nature of the intervention of the state. It changes institutions and culture. And all kinds of major changes occur. And sometimes they get undone, by the way. Banking laws were changed after the Great Depression, 1930s. And then they were undone by Bill Clinton in the 1980s, the Glass-Siegel Act. So it doesn't mean that they all move in one direction. They move this way, they come back, they move in a different direction. Perhaps it's a broad general direction of, of uh, more support for basic incomes, and uh, except in the United States, health care and access to education and so on. But even that can move back. Certainly wages, which were rising, essentially stagnated afterwards. So you can't say that there's any intrinsic law to this. It depends on the balance of power and the institutional structure and so on. If you look at the long crisis of 1873 to 93, that's the official timing of that crisis. That is a length of time of 20 years. If you look at the Great Depression, then from 1929 to 1941, the entry of the US into World War II is 12 years. But if you count the US participation in World War II as part of the Great Depression, covered up by the war, then you have 17 years. The Great Stagflation from 18, 1966 to 82, that's 17 years. And these are numbers that I already had developed in, in a much earlier article 20 years ago about the Great Stagflation. But you know that 80, 82 is roughly where Reagan, 80 is where Reagan comes in, 82 is where you see the recovery. So it's not hard to time that one. And 67 is the end of the Vietnam War boom and the sort of decline. So you can see that. And then the gro global crisis of 2007, well, we're now, that's obviously uh, for last year, we're now uh, 10 years into it, uh, uh, nine years into it. So if it is on the order of 17 to 20 years, you got some time. Now, obviously, this varies by country. There are some countries uh, who are not coming out of it, in fact, are deeply mired in it, and others who are at least not so mired. But I'm talking here just to the US, because these are US data. 
So other things being equal, if the, cycle, if the patterns repeat, we're looking, for, uh, we're looking at another few years, let's say, six years, five years for the recovery. But the recovery also now depends on what's happening in the rest of the world, much more so than ever. So these are just exercises in thought. Uh, yeah. So what is a recovery? For recovery, you have to raise the net rate of profit. And that has an interesting problem, because the interest rate is already at zero, effectively. So that uh, monetary stimulus trick can't work any longer. Now, you know, they talk about negative interest rates, but that's just nonsense. What that means is they charge you a finance fee for putting your money in the central bank. Nobody's actually giving you money for your uh, putting money in the bank in any large sum. Otherwise, it would be a negative interest rate. If I could put $50,000 in and they gave me $60,000 know, for just leaving it in there, that would be wonderful. But that's not going to happen. The interest rate is zero. Um, we know that banks and businesses have many zombie assets still, assets which are not marked to what they would actually fetch in the market. And in fact, often are given values which are completely arbitrary and no one challenges because they are so-called proprietary. Uh, the movie The Big Short brings this up in, in great detail, as does the book and many other books about the banking system and all that. If you go on the internet now, it's amazing how many people who are conservatives are predicting another financial collapse. And well-known people, I mean pretty famous people are talking about this. So what needs to be done is to keep suppressing real wage relative to productivity. And that means keep the unemployment rate high, and more importantly, if you have an unemployment rate which is moderate, to keep the pressure of the Reserve Army of Labor in the rest of the world on uh, labor everywhere. This, I argue, is the secret to uh, neoliberalism. It's also the secret to globalization because it's the availability of cheap labor. Capital either goes to where the labor is, or it threatens to bring the labor in, or, in, or both. And I would argue this is what the secret of austerity economics in Europe. I want to defend, in quotation marks, uh, the German finance minister, Schauble, because it's not that he doesn't know that austerity will create depression. It's because he does know that austerity will create depression, that he's in favor of it. And when you look at what he says, and what many of them say, they want more, quote unquote, competitive labor markets. To do this, you have to get rid of the state in Greece and Spain and Italy, creating employment through government employment, because that provides a, uh, base for the, a place for the reserve army to go. And you can do cutbacks. You can privatize those things. You can get profits out of them. You can reduce the employment. You increase the reserve army of labor. You weaken labor, you weaken the welfare state, you create a depression, that's good for capital. So I think many people argue, Keynesian especially seem to say, I don't understand how these people don't realize it's a great, they'll cause misery and pain. And the answer is, of course they realize that. They say that what they're doing is going to restore growth. And I think in that sense they're right. But of course they don't say that a lot of people are going to be suffering to get there. <coughs> 